Oh. Hi. Hi. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're going to do audience Q&A later on, as I, and as I understand it, s little slips of paper are circulating on which you inscribe your questions, and then the slips of paper will come up here by means that I don't quite understand. <laughs> there they are. They're coming up here right now, um, but we're going to get to them a bit later. Let's sort of go all the way back. Um, let's talk about uh, how you guys met. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, uh, we actually, uh, I'm jo uh, Joseph and I met back in 2009 when Joseph moved to New York. And I don't think you knew anybody in New York? I moved to New York. I didn't, I didn't know anyone. I had no job lined up. <laughs> I'd never been to New York. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it took me six months to find a job. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm in a uh, Cecil as well. Uh, Cecil and I are in a uh, theater company here in New York City called the New York Neo Futurists. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. And um, yeah, and so one of the, I was doing the show. We do a weekly uh, late night show in the East Village called Too Much Light Makes the Baby Go Blind. And I write and perform in that show. And Joseph started coming to Too Much Light and watching the show and volunteering. And, and uh, we met because you came up to me after. Mm -hmm. He show. did. Uh, he did a performance art piece about burning a book mm -hmm. uh, that he didn't like, and I came up to him afterwards and told him I thought that the piece had been I immoral, uh, <laughs> and we've been friends since. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was an awful book. <laughs> it, yeah, I fair. mean, I agree. It, it, it's not a good book. <laughs> what was the book? I would never tell anyone. Joseph's the only one I think who really knows because I don't want people to go out and buy it. <laughs> <laughs> don't even give them that. <laughs> um, and then Cecil, you're, you're, also, you're also doing the theater thing. So I was doing the theater, uh, working with Too Much Light, and um, uh, uh, you know, uh, being the, the, the archetypal struggling waiter actor. Um, I know I'm blazing paths way, pathways with that one. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I wrote a, a play about how ever since I was a kid, I, I've had you know the sort of 1950s radio announcer voice. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That happened naturally. That's not the product of years of you know no. meditation. And, no, you know. no, it's not. Uh -huh. um, no, it was very confusing when I would answer the phone, <laughs> <laughs> sounding like an adult. <laughs> um, but I, but uh, and I was you know struggling to kind of find voiceover work, and it's a tough business to break into. And uh, and and you know, a sort of a la Carl Castle, I gifted um, a uh, outgoing voicemail message to an audience member a night. Um, and, and Joseph saw that piece and said, hey, I'm working on this podcast that is kind of in that same vein. Would you like to record it? Um, and, you know, let's see, what, let's see what happens. And that was kind and of how I got brought in. Some stuff happened in this. <laughs> and then this, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you did a good job. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Um, and then Night Vale, uh, how did that come together? I'm sort of curious about like the, what was the first piece of it that arrived? What was the first building or what was the first character? Do you remember? I actually know, yeah, I, so I, I got fired um, from that job that <laughs> took me six months to get. I worked there three years and then they fired me. Um, and then I started writing Night Vale very soon afterwards. Um, so that worked out. Um, and I, yeah, I had this idea, I remember the, the the name Night Vale I thought I had stolen, like it just seemed too good, that I just spent a few days Googling it because I was sure I had stolen that from something. <laughs> uh, and then that, it turned out I, I didn't, so that was there. And then I, I just started going off like a gut feeling, and I remember the very first thing I wrote was in the first episode, there's a paragraph just about uh, the lights above the Arby's. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very short <laughs> paragraph, but I wrote that, and I'm like, okay, so this is what I'm going for, like this is that, <laughs> The gut feeling that this gives me is just what I'm going to keep chasing, and mm -hmm. then everything else was kind of written based off of, does it make me feel like that Arby's paragraph? Mm. <laughs> that's how the first, that's that's a great how the question. first episode. <laughs> it's a classic from the writing, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. writing classes. Uh, and then I've, I'm picturing, like, sitting down, the, the sort of making of the first episode. Do you remember hearing Cecil read the words and sense that it was coming together? I was blown away by, like, because, uh, you know, Cecil sent me those recordings, and then we have a friend, John Bernstein, who goes by Disparition when he performs, who I just knew had hours of music online that was really awesome. <laughs> um, I hadn't listened to all of it, but I'd listened enough to be like, this is really cool, and so I emailed him, being like, hey, I, I don't, re I'm doing a thing, I don't really know what it is, do you mind if I use your music? <laughs> and right. John is a super nice person, so he said, sure. 
and I put it, I, I took these, these recordings Cecil had sent me and I put them with John's music and I'm, I just remember being like, oh my God, this is way better than I expected. <laughs> I, I remember walking around my neighborhood, just like no one else had heard the first episode. I was just listening yeah. to it on a loop because it just seemed better than I had thought I, thought I was capable of getting uh -oh. anyone, like getting together other people to do and like being in, like it was just, it just seemed so fully formed and it kind of took me by surprise. And why a podcast? You, I mean, you guys were into theater. You could have done it as theater. You're clearly capable of writing a novel. You could have done it, done it in, any, in any form. Why, why a podcast? We spent, Joseph and I, when we, once we started talking and hanging out more, we, in 2010, we decided, let's write a play. So we wrote a play, and we performed that play at, uh, down in the East Village, uh, as you do. And we uh, did the show in 2011. And during, the, during all of our writing meetings and such, we, we just talked about podcasts. We had a long list of podcasts we were both listening to and we really loved. And we are just, at one point in time, let's, we should do a podcast. Okay, sure, yeah, that sounds great. And um, a lot of it just comes out of, you know, theater is a lot of fun. It's really wonderful to have like the dynamic personal relationship to people in a room. Um, and, but it's also extraordinarily expensive, right? Like when you put on a show, we did that, we did the play, we did, we did eight performances of it over two weeks. And I think maybe 150 people saw it and we definitely lost money off of it. And it's fine, like it's a fun thing to do. Uh, you just make budgets so you don't lose too much money. In podcasts, uh, we had a $65 USB mic that I just already, I had had it for a few years. Yeah, so that was, <laughs> it was sitting around with me not recording music into it is what it was mainly mm -hmm. doing. <laughs> And so there was, yeah, it's this really low bar financial barrier of entry into the world of podcasting. And right. it's, a, it's a thing you can kind of sustain for a long time. And also, early on, I would have friends be like, I'm sorry, I haven't listened to your podcast yet. And I remember thinking, that's totally fine. If you had told me, I'm sorry I didn't come see your play, I'm like, shunned, we're done. <laughs> right. I put so much work into that and you did not come see my play. But a podcast, it, it exists online, it's free, it's available mm -hmm. at any time you want it. Uh, and so you put up the first episode online, and then millions of fans listen mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. Right away, instantly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right away, instantly. <laughs> <laughs> we ran into uh, a woman last night who said she'd been listening since episode two. Wow. And I was so impressed, because yeah. like, I think episode two, when it first went out, maybe got 30 downloads. Episode yeah. one was, in the first month, I think had 52 total downloads, which is the sum total of all three of our friends, I yep. think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so that was, and mm -hmm. being someone we didn't know personally that had been listening since episode two, that was really amazing. Yeah, um, yeah it, was a, it was a slow but steady growth uh, until July of 2013. Yeah, what it, happened then? <laughs> Tumblr. Tumblr. Yeah. <laughs> Bolstered by Twitter. Yeah. And Reddit, I would say. Yeah. You know, because yeah. like the Twitter feed that you all make is so spot on. And I mean, I know that uh, d during that time period, I, I, I encountered a lot of people who were like, I didn't even know there was a podcast attached to this Twitter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because at that point, like the Twitter was like the voice was so strong mm -hmm. on that. Um, so, yeah. Um, and what is it do you think people respond to? What were they responding to about the about the show? It's a great question. Um, there's kind of, I think, two answers. Like, there's um, one is, uh, I think, kind of in a, a general storytelling sense, it deals with, uh, it deals with the world being dangerous and terrifying and full of things that could suddenly kill you, and there's not a lot you can do about it, and just having to get on with that. I mean, based on that, you could imagine the great appeal of a podcast about a town where no conspiracy theories are true. <laughs> they are all false. Uh -huh. That would be very comforting in a way. Mm -hmm. But we have to live in the world where things are dangerous. So I think, ha I, think I mean, I think I wrote it, started writing it for that reason of there's something very comforting about people being okay with the fact that things are not always great mm -hmm. and that things can kill them. <laughs> um, there's something very comforting about that. Um, I, that, I, I, I think, was a, a major uh, you know, part of it. And then the, the other major piece uh, was, you know, that the, the big spike in popularity came after our uh, one year anniversary, uh, which is where uh, kind of the, the main character, Cecil, uh, and, Car and the handsome scientist, Carlos, finally got together. And I think there was, um, you know, it, it was a thing that we, it was just completely organic uh, in terms of that was just 
the characters just it made sense and it happened there. And then, um, but a, a lot of people really responded to the fact that there was a, a gay main character who that was not their defining feature, that the story was about other things and also they were gay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, question I'd like all three of you to answer, and um, please answer as soon as you buzz. Uh, <laughs> if you were to hypothetically <laughs> cosplay as a character, which one would you cosplay <laughs> as? We're all thinking it, right? I'm cosplaying as Cecil right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's very true. Um, I would, uh, God, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to think, like, practically speaking, the hooded figure would be great, because that's, uh, <laughs> again, like, uh, as a person who's not super crafty, that would be a, an easy, a very simple costume to pull together, I think. Yeah. Although some people put it together really, really well, and I'm impressed in a way that I don't, I think I would just look like a guy with a black sheet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I would probably cosplay as Megan Wallaby. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> That would be amazing. Because I think I would look very handsome as a Russian sailor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> think that'd be a good Halloween costume? You already do. I do. <laughs> I'm halfway there. <laughs> All right, lightning round two. Again, answer as soon as you buzz. Which two characters do you ship? Mm. <laughs> Brass tacks. Brass tacks, people. Uh, the one that I've seen that's my favorite, I think, is Intern Maureen and uh, Michelle Wynn. Mm -hmm. uh, the yeah. Intern Maureen is, is the, uh, well, it was actually, originally it was Maureen Johnson. Uh, we named her after her, and then uh, we, as we do with all our interns, killed her off. <laughs> and uh, Maureen Johnson led a Twitter campaign against us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we agreed to bring her back to life uh, if she played her on the show if Maureen would come and play her on the show. And so Maureen, John, intern Maureen turned into this amazing character voiced by the, our, one of our favorite people and a great author, Maureen Johnson. Mm -hmm. uh, and Michelle Wynn is a amazing character to write. And I think that, uh, yeah, I would enjoy listening to those conversations. <laughs> um, I would probably ship uh, Old Woman Josie and the Angels. <laughs> <laughs> In a in a polyamorous non-gender binary yeah. <laughs> truffle, if you will. Maybe they already are. Mm -hmm. Maybe they already. It's all, are. all the work has been <laughs> yeah. done for me. Yeah. yeah. I would do uh, all of station management and yeah. all of the city council. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. <laughs> Unrelated note: I have an episode idea. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> um, now I want to talk about the novel, which is really great. Uh, you and you guys are podcast billionaires. You're sitting on this <laughs> titanic mound of cash. Yeah. Uh, why? Um, why write a novel? Well, where did that impetus come from? We like we liked writing. We we like just the the form of. Oh, actually, I'll, I'll say this: that we say this a lot. We we get compared a lot with the podcast to radio drama, and we our background really isn't in radio drama. We have backgrounds in theater, but uh, our background really is in kind of the more monologue storytelling, like the the person on the stage telling a story. And when you see a script for the podcast, it looks like a short story. It's like a six or seven page short story. It's all Cecil. Uh, speaking about the town. It feels like more of a radio drama because there's many characters, but it's really just one voice for 95% of the show. And I think we have a long, we both really love books. We love reading books. We like writing short stories. We like writing uh, in prose format. And I think there was just, it made logical sense after we'd already done a live show and put it on stage with our theater backgrounds to say, I think our next step is to write a novel. And it gives us a chance to get outside of Cecil Palmer's worldview and look inside the heads of characters. What, what's it like to be a 19-year-old pawn shop owner? What's it like to be a single mother in Night Vale and experience their lives, really be in the streets, be in the library, be in the city hall, be uh, at the Night Vale Daily Journal, like go into these buildings in a way that Cecil can only tell you he did once or something. Right. And you have this vast smorgasbord of characters. How did you settle on the ones that you did as the heroes? Well, we knew, you know, we knew that we wanted to, to 
bring other characters into focus because we really didn't want to retell the story of the podcast because we had already written it and it just seemed very uninteresting to us uh, to have to just kind of take all those scripts and try and cram them into a novel and just call it a novel. Um, and so we, we really knew we wanted to tell someone else's story. Um, and you know, Diane Creighton is a character that's been in the podcast almost from the start. Um, but as a very minor character, um, just kind of going in and out, and she's just kind of been there. Um, and Jeffrey wanted to focus in on her, and I, I had had for quite a while, she'd actually never been on the podcast, but I just had in my head this image, a lot of, a lot of stuff for Nightfield that I write just starts with something that gets stuck in my head, and it, it just stays there until I write something with it. And I had this image of a young pawn shop owner sitting at her counter, looking out her window at these lights over the sky, like lights over the desert, and um, so I just sort of started writing that, and those became the two main characters. Right, mm -hmm. and then the man in the tan jacket obviously plays a pivotal role. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was um, when we because he was uh, one of the early first year uh, episodes, the man in the tan jacket, and it was that was something I when I when we first wrote that episode, that was something that came out of actually a person I saw in um, Louisiana. <laughs> And um, because it was Louisiana, and um, I was I was I was at a friend's house and who lived in Jackson, Mississippi, and I was driving late night back uh, to New Orleans, and I saw like a light uh, in the middle of the night uh, up ahead on the uh, on the highway, and as I got closer, I realized it was a car on fire, like completely engulfed in flames, and as I got closer, I remember having this moment of like I. I hope everything is fine, and I, I, I remember what's <laughs> happening, and then about 40 sure feet away, and as I'm slowing down just to look and see what's going on, about 40 feet away, there's just a man standing there, and I can't really see his face, I just see him casually, very calmly and casually smoking a cigarette against the, <laughs> against the guardrail. I'm like, I'm gonna assume everything's just fine. <laughs> And I remember calling it in, and uh, they were like, all right, well, we'll send somebody. I told them the mile and just went back to my hotel. But I, it just, that image is, for some reason, always stuck with me. And uh, it would just, I thought about this idea of just, and I think one of the first images of the man in the tent jacket, the Cecil described seeing him, like, in, a, in the podcast, he was standing next to just a refrigerator on the side of the road that was engulfed in flame, because that seemed, that seemed less surreal somehow. <laughs> But yeah, he's always been this mystery because nobody can remember him after seeing him. They just remember faint glimpses and it just sort of fades. And, and we've, we've wanted to tell that story for a long time. And the novel really gave us more room to really deal with him. Uh, right. Yeah. And how does the co-writing work? How does that collaborating happen? What's the? I do, I do adjectives. Um, <laughs> so about half of the nouns. Uh -huh. Uh, we've been writing together for a little over or under five years, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, in that time we've developed uh, a process that just works really well for us. And <laughs> <laughs> don't know what just happened. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, and, and it's, it's what we do for the podcast and we, we kept it exactly the same for the novel, which is basically, I mean, a lot of it's based on just casual conversation and uh, being like, hey, I have this idea where I do this. Okay and then just trusting the other person, um, kind of working with off what they do. We do a lot of like, uh, you know, we alternate episodes and we uh, did a lot of alternating chapters with this, mm. but then we go and edit each other's work um, and talk about it. So it all ultimately ends up being both of ours, although we, you know, there's stuff that is very much his first draft or my first draft, but right. it, it's gone through a lot of rewrites with both of us. How, I mean, your voices on the page, they can't be I identical, is there, what, are there certain things that one person does well, particularly well, or the other person does particularly well? How would you characterize the differences? Because there must be differences. Thanks. I don't. I don't know. I never really think about it as like somebody doing something well or not. Like, there's definitely times when Joseph will write a script and send it over to me, and I'll read it and be like, "Oh crap, that's amazing! Like that's that's a really that's a really amazing joke or phrase or something like mm -hmm. that." I never really think like uh, I, I don't know that I necessarily have this thought of like, "Oh, Joseph does this particular thing." Uh, so well, but uh, it's more just like you see a piece of writing you really like and you think about you sort of deconstruct it in your mind of like This right. is why this really worked here and um, I th That's kind of how I, I, I receive it I, I I do think voice wise when I think about when we write things that aren't Night Vale uh, that you write a thing That's your own or uh, vice versa the I mean I definitely think I tend t more towards the abstract or poetic uh, Just in my own voice so that may be something that bleeds into the 
Yeah, I agree. Like, I, I really love Jeffrey's writing. It's why I've been writing with him mm -hmm. for so long. Um, but yeah, I can't, there, I can't really, we don't really think of it, I think, in terms of like specialization or anything, except for one thing, <laughs> which is if you read a sports joke, <laughs> that's him. <laughs> Got it. Because I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, but other than that, yeah, it, it's very, there is stuff in the early episodes that neither of us quite remember who wrote. Yeah, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not 100% right all the time, mm -hmm. but you, uh, especially in the first year, I think uh, I could kind of get a gut feeling of being like, this feels like a Joseph episode, this feels like mm -hmm. a Jeffrey episode. Um, yeah. And were you sort of helpless onlooker as this novel is getting <laughs> extruded? Or uh, were you looking at drafts and, and, and talking no, about No, no, not at all. I actually kind of uh, waited as long as I could because uh, I wanted to have that experience of, you know, reading it for the first time when it was complete like, you know, anybody else because, um, I don't know, it's just like kind of a fun surprise as opposed to the sort of ongoing uh, um, podcast, you know, kind of episodic world of, you know, you get a little bit at a time. I kind of mm -hmm. wanted to have that. The novel has arrived in its mm -hmm. completion, mm -hmm. you know. What happens when you disagree about what should happen? That happens not that often. I mean, it does happen, but it's at a very, it's less than a disagreeing, and it's more of like, we're talking about, here's some ideas, and here's some ideas how I have, and it's, it's, ne we, it's never really a disagreement so much as a like, okay, well, let's just talk about, let's bring these ideas together, talk it over, and then we'll figure out what we're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, we don't, we, it, it, it's, we never, I think it would be super counterproductive to come into it as, here's, here's what I want to have happen, and here's mm -hmm. what you want to have happen, and now let's decide who's right. Because yeah. that's, A, you're gonna get worse stuff, <laughs> right. and B, that's just gonna be so unpleasant. Yeah. <laughs> We've been pretty good, I mean, like, like we talked about earlier, like the, you know, upon our first real conversation being about like, hey, I disagree fundamentally with this play that you wrote, you know, this thing that you did. And you know, you just sort of, there was a comfort right there, right? Like there was no, I never really felt like, who are you? Like, what's your thing? Like, leave me alone. It was really like, oh, this is a very good point you're presenting in a way that I understand. And so sometimes we have, like, we, have you know, have episodes where, like, you know, somebody will sub send over the episode they wrote and the other will say, you know, that's, that's different than what I feel like we talked about before and say, what do you mean? And you just kind of elaborate on that and then you just hash it out. But I don't think we've ever had a moment of, like, we can't do this other than like there are some like true continuity things where you're like you yeah. we actually can't phrase it like this because of this oh of course of course and yeah uh you mentioned before um writers that you like who who are some of those writers that you like who are the who do you think of as the influences on this book i think f uh, there is a uh there's a playwright uh named will eno that uh, was really meaningful to me. I've uh, seen many of, of his plays and watched his plays, and he has a lot of his uh, work is uh, solo performers. Uh, uh, his most famous work was about 10 years ago called uh, Tom Paine Based on Nothing, and it's this really amazing monologue, and it's, he's so confrontational with the audience um, in a way that plays off of the expectations of what a person on stage should be doing. Mm -hmm. And he builds these very simple sentences. They're not ornate, they're very simple, but they often go in directions you're not expecting. Right. And that type of beauty of language, that type of like playing with expectations and structure, I've always just found um, really exciting and, and really moving. He does some really amazing stuff with, with words. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of our biggest uh, influences. He, uh, Joseph and I are both big fans. Yeah, yeah. Going into Night Night Vale, like the, I think the two biggest influences in terms of language were Willie, you know, and then Debel and Unferth, who is a novelist and also a memoirist. Um, and she, I bought her book Vacation uh, very soon after moving to New York, just because it was on sale somewhere, <laughs> uh, and it had a cool looking cover. And then I read it, and then I immediately flipped to the front page and read it again. Um, and it, she really. I learned so much about what you can do with language from that book. Just, right. she really is the one that taught me that you can surprise people not just with plot or character, but with language, that you can land a sentence in a completely different place. You can set up a reader with the first part of a sentence and then land it somewhere completely different just right. with the language. Um, it, it really, yeah. Uh, p p putting those two together, I think, were the initial stages in developing the shared language of Night Vale. And then uh, in terms of the novel itself, one that I had read 
just before we started working on it. Um, and that I think helped me sort of clarify the structure a bit is um, the book Night Film mm -hmm. by, and you're gonna have to, is it Marissa? Marissa Peschel. Mm -hmm. Marissa yeah. Peschel. Marissa. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't remember where the sha and where the sa uh, was. <laughs> um, but it's a brilliant book. I really love that book. Uh, and I love that it uses a mystery as an excuse to explore a place, which in her case is a very surreal version of New York City. Um, but yeah, it, it, that kind of helped clarify this idea that you can set up a mystery, but then use that mystery as an excuse to just really explore a place. Um, so that's another one that I think directly applied to, to, to the novel. And I, I think too, like for uh, Cecil and, and I to, uh, being in the neo-futurist, because one of the things about that show is, is that that weekly show is 30 plays in 60 minutes. There's a timer on the wall. You write 30 plays, you write new plays every single week. It's always turning out. And part of the goal is not just to make a fast paced like sketch comedy show. We call them plays and that they have a beginning, middle and end and they're tiny. And you also want to balance this menu out and learning, I think spending you know, eight or nine years in that company was, it's this real lesson about like variety and uh, randomness and, and having having really, really absurd comedy mixed with weird poetry mixed with like personal, personal sad monologue mixed with politics, uh, I think was a really interesting way to kind of keep the writing voice varied. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is my last question before we go to audience questions. Um, one of the things I love about the podcast is you know, this, you, you spin out these sort of marvelous, mysterious kind of uh, uh, phenomena um, and, and, you know, and they remain in, in, in the air in this wonderful, weird, dark, enchanted, uh, uh, just sort of hovering like that. Uh, in a novel, you've got to have a, a, a beginning, middle, and end. Um, you can't leave, there, there are some mysteries have to be solved. Um, how do you take that and, and, and put it into a novel that's beginning, middle, and end? That was probably the hardest thing for us. Uh, you know, because everything else, the, the writing process, the, the amount of writing, that was all stuff that we had already been doing with the podcast. But with the podcast, we can do this thing where we're just continually juggling. We're just continually like bringing things down and then throwing other things up in the air and it's just a continuous thing. Uh, and yeah, we got towards the end of the book and we're like, oh, we have to, we do have to resolve everything and bring <laughs> everything together. And, I think we did it, but it was a, it was probably the only time that we really had to like sit together and really solve it as a problem and mm -hmm. figure out how to do something new that we that we weren't doing with the podcast. I, I remember coming away, you know, because there's certain authors that you read and you're like, I really like this author, but I feel like they don't know how to end books. You're like, yeah. their, their, their endings are always really unsatisfying. And then I, after doing this, I came away being like, they ended their novels. They, the novels ended. I'm so proud of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good that the novels ended. <laughs> it's really hard to do. <laughs> um, we are going to transition seamlessly to audience questions, of which I have a stack here. Lovely. Great. Um, I'm going to. Cecil, why don't you read them? Right? Oh, all right. <laughs> oh, nice. Voice. All right. Uh, do you think the Mets will win the World Series? <laughs> in four, five, six, or seven games? <laughs> um, don't, sports, yeah, don't ball. Go sports ball, <laughs> go. Did, let, let me add, but uh, Toronto won last night, right? So that's that the Kansas City Toronto thing isn't resolved, right? Okay, I'm just making sure. So that, that, that might change things. Um, I think that the, uh, I think that if they're going to play, I think if Toronto ends up winning, I think the Mets probably sweep that team. Um, sorry, Canada. <laughs> You had a good week otherwise. Um, and then uh, I think, uh, yeah. Are the yeah. Cubs still in the running? Oh my god, too no. soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, um, like, I'm like a surrogate Chicagoan, no. so I, I, in my heart of hearts, I still no, want No, Back them. to the Future did oh. not come true. And, oh. um, <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Baseball Talk with <laughs> Joseph and Jeffrey and Cecil. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is actually a question for Cecil, and it has a mystical eye on it. So Great. try not to meet the gaze of the okay. mystical eye. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, when you envision Cecil Palmer, what outfit do you picture him wearing? <laughs> uh, no, this is a really interesting question because uh, I get this a lot, and, and it's always uh, what, what is he wearing? What does he look like? How, what, what is, you know, the, this, I, honestly, I do not think about that at all. Um, it's, I don't know, it, as an actor, uh, I think it's 
very, uh, it's very strange to think about what you know, your character is is physically doing on a radio show. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think it's much more uh, effective and more uh, interesting to think about what the other people in the scene are doing in relation to your character. Uh, so what is Cecil Plummer wearing? I don't know, whatever I'm wearing that day when I record. <laughs> Um, anywhere from hence, hence the poncho and cat ears. Hence poncho, yeah. yeah. Poncho and cat ears and furry pants and tunic. <laughs> down to recording in my boxer shorts in 102 degree New York City summer <laughs> weather. That's somewhere in there is <laughs> what Cecil's wearing. Uh, I'm going to interject a question of my own because it just occurred to me. You guys must have had had Hollywood interest. You must have talked to someone about about movies or, or TV. Have you guys had those conversations? Yeah, we, I mean, we've gotten interest, but it's it's a, a thing of, you know, we we really want to always be doing something with Night Vale that seems worthwhile mm -hmm. um, and that we feel like we can do well. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was why a novel really was something we wanted to do, because we felt like this is something we really love and something that we, we know how to do. We know how to write prose. Um, and I, I think the idea of movies and TV and in the abstract is really interesting, but it's just, it's a thing of where we want to move really slowly and make sure that we know what it is and what we're doing mm -hmm. and uh, that, yeah. it's, that it's good in the way that we like making the show because it's the show we like making and we want to keep that up. Yes. And it's, I'm uh, not even 100% sure how cameras work. No, so. <laughs> <don't know. laughs> no idea. Something with a mirror. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm an actual community radio intern uh, in, so sorry. in Troy, New York. Uh, are there any steps I can take to avoid certain doom? Uh, Follow-up question, what advice do you have for an aspiring subversive radio host? Uh, I would say don't intern on Night Vale Community Radio. No. Uh, is probably Tro step I, one. I bet Troy Community Radio is pretty okay, it's, right? Yeah, I bet like that's five sort of percent safe. chance of doom. There's some, <laughs> yeah. There's definitely a lot of snakes upstate. Yeah. I do know that. Sure. Don't please don't tell that to my wife. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get her to move there. <laughs> uh, and uh, advice for aspiring subversive radio host. Yeah, I mean, S take that Troy Community Radio and just fight the power. Do fight it. the power. <laughs> Yeah. Definitely subvert things. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Like, I never worked in, I honestly never worked in radio. I spent a lot of time listening to radio. I love radio. And, uh, but it's, it's hard to know. Like, I, from what little I do know of meeting people who have worked in that in industry, I mean, I think it's a, a super competitive industry like many industries. But I do think that, you know, there's only so many, like, radio hosting jobs. So I think. Like, uh, like anything in the entertainment industry, I, I, the only thing I can think of is like stay in your lane, right? Like find the thing that you get good at and do that thing well and, uh, and be ready to move on to the next level in that, in whatever it is you do, whether it's running the board, being a, te a technical operator, whether or not it's d finding a way to host a show, start a podcast if you want to do that, I think, because that's a, a easier, anyone can do that or is there's limited radio host jobs. There's a, a podcast you might want to listen to. I've only listened to an episode or two, so I can't really recommend it in a deep way, but they're, it's annoyingly called Millennial. Um, <laughs> it's by a woman named Megan Tan, but it's really interesting in that it's uh, about uh, somebody in their early 20s who just graduated from college and really wants to have a career in radio. Um, and she made a really well-produced podcast kind of documenting her own journey in trying to get hired in radio. <laughs> um, it's kind of fascinating. Sounds good. Is a, is a real trenchant, okay, incisive all right. one. Uh, all right, I'm gonna be ready for this one. Uh, what is your stance <laughs> on oh. <laughs> artisanal cheese? Go. Th these are the best questions we've gotten. Is that <laughs> cream. I, um, what is your stance on artisanal cheese? In favor. Show me. Definitely pro. Show me your stance on artisanal cheese. <laughs> I think it's a hunched over kind of thing. It's it's like a direct. Yeah. You want to limit the space between cheese and mouth. Lean yeah. in. Yeah. 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 To so me, it's really get it more in about the arms and the shoulders, like getting the shoulders squared above the hips. 
And I think there's something to that, yeah. I imagine it's something like a, you know, like a rum ad, where you've got like your cheese under your foot. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, we need boss. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have only four. I thought there'd be many more questions. Are this, is these all the questions? We got, we got ten, like we got like ten questions. Oh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't, we may go back to the, the well after we exhaust these four more questions. Just pass them forward. Just pass <laughs> them forward here. Pass them forward. We'll grab them. All right. Oh, well, this is a good run. Okay. What was your favorite episode to write or perform? Uh, I know mine. Uh, I, I had a blast. I think the first uh, episode that stands out to perform was Cassette, is my favorite. Um, it was just so much fun to get to do different ages of the same character. Hmm. Um, uh, and, it, and it also kind of took me back to when I was uh, a teenager and kind of tr trying to recapture that energy. And I don't know, it was just really fun. It was like a fun challenge as mm -hmm. an actor to get to do. Um, so yeah, that was, that yeah. was a good one. I mean, I, mine changes all the time. I have all these different reasons. I mean, one of the more recent ones that just was an absolute blast to write because it was this true collaborative <laughs> Uh, effort. Nice shirt. There you go. Yeah. Oh, nice. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> right. um, was uh, uh, Best Of. That was one of my favorite oh, yeah. ones because that was, it was one where, it, that was one where we, I mean, we weren't in the same room writing, but it was a very different writing process where we really sat through and talked about like what that episode would be structured like. And we really got excited about the structure. And so then it became this thing where, um, you know, I would set, I set up the setups for the scenes of, of uh, what Leonard was finding on these old tapes. And then I just left it hanging, and then I would come back in the writing of like what just happened, and then Joseph would fill in <laughs> what that was. And so it was this neat like kind of writing prompt thing that we went back and forth. And then uh, we had John Bernstein produce that episode fully and write all of this really amazing music for each of the time periods that it kind of goes through. But that was a, that was a really fun one. To that was, and that was a fun one to perform as well. <coughs> like I remember getting that script and thinking, oh my God, every page was like a different, a completely different episode. Yeah. You know, it was like, I, I was, you know, at home recording. I was like, man, I, I, I feel like the Kate Blanchett of podcasting <laughs> right now. <laughs> I like really kind of like podcasting. Mm -hmm. I'd like that on a t-shirt, please. <laughs> um, uh, but no, it was like it really kind of you know because it was like you know one page was you know as dark as it could get, and mm -hmm. the next page was as bright as it could get, and the next page was you know and it really kind of unfolded every mm -hmm. every section. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess okay. I have two answers. I really loved the best of um, the the first one. I remember being really excited about just because it was so weird was uh, a story about you, uh, which is early on. That was just, uh, Meg and I went on vacation uh, to the beach and it rained all week and I got, and we both got sick. Um, and so I was just sitting uh, in the bedroom just, and I started writing uh, this weird short story uh, and then I, s I think I wrote about like a quarter of it and I sent it to Jeffrey and I'm like, I'm writing this thing. D it sounds nothing like a Night Vale episode. Do you think we could just make it a Night Vale episode though? <laughs> uh, and it was, it was really exciting because it, it, it was, I think the first time I realized, oh, we can do anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like we can take any idea and make it work as a Night Vale episode. Um, so that really like, I think opened things up in terms of let's try weird stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm really excited about speaking of best of and speaking about John uh, producing stuff. There's an episode that's not out yet. Uh, it's coming up uh, called Lost in the Mail that is co-written with uh, a friend of ours, Zach Parsons, who has written a few episodes um, and really always nails it. He really has a, a strong sense of the Night Vale voice. Uh, and he wrote this really beautiful short story about a character that's never been in the show before. And he, it's this beautiful self-contained story uh, and uh, it involves some complicated audio stuff, so I brought in John to produce it, and, uh, and it's one of those things that I haven't heard how it's gonna turn out yet, because John hasn't done it yet, but I'm, <laughs> I am very excited for mm -hmm. it. All right, let's see here. Mm -hmm. uh, what is a typical Night Vale wedding like? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, blood. Blood or cannons. Um. 
remains to be seen, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the remains. The remains. The remains, <laughs> the remains are seen. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, in general, our answer to stuff like that is we kind of invent stuff when it hits the page. And if, it's, <laughs> if it's not on the page, we probably don't know. Yeah. Sorry. Yet. Yet. Yeah. It, I bet as soon as it hits the page, it's, mm. it's true. Mm. <laughs> I do think there would be a lot of birds. Mm. <laughs> Just in general, everywhere. In general. Mm -hmm. Billions of years from now. Good start. <laughs> we're, we're really working on a grand scale here. Um, <laughs> When the story of Night Vale ends, how do you see it finishing? Oh, that's good. Do we <coughs> reveal the secret end, like the final script we've had? The one that goes up in one billion years? <laughs> <laughs> the final word is scar. We can reveal that. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, that's yeah, we don't have an ending in mind. I don't know. We're going to die someday. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I would like to record Night Vale until you, someone literally pries the microphone <laughs> out of my dying hand. Mm -hmm. That's uh, how it ends. That's it. And that is how it ends with Cecil Baldwin's death live on microphone. <laughs> it's like my rosebud moment. <laughs> oh, oh, this is a long one. All right, here we go. Uh, Jeffrey and Joseph, so many characters have been created in Welcome to Night Vale. Uh, do friends and family ever approach you and say, hey, is such and such character based on me or that time when? Um, and if so, were they ever flattered? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have never based a character on a family member. Um, I based one character on someone I know. Mm -hmm. um, and I won't tell them who it is. It's, <laughs> it's no one in this room. But <laughs> there was one character that I think was pretty specifically. I was like, I, I think I, I think I know who you're talking about. But yep, uh, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. Like, I, I kind of feel like um, uh, Jackie's mom's house kind of is like very similar. Like in my mind, when I was recording the audiobook, like I imagined your. It's Your described mom? as super neat. Have you seen my mom's? Oh, okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mom. I mean, but again, it's, uh, it, it, maybe it's just me, yeah. like, kind of projecting on there. But like that whole thing with there's like that scene where she goes to her house. Like, I imagine, like, in my mind, like that took place in. Oh, in that's interesting. Camarillo, yeah. uh -huh. You know. Yeah, I, I mean that might because I did write the first draft of that scene, so it's very possible that that was some like, like it was not conscious. There, 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 wa there is in the book a very conscious like location basis, which is when you go into the Nightville Public Library, which you do in the book, mm -hmm. um, you get to see what it's like <laughs> on the inside. Uh, it is very, very heavily based on the uh, Camarillo, California Public Library, not the new public library. Right. That we all know, but the uh, <laughs> the old one that closed about seven or eight years ago that I spent a lot of my childhood in, uh, the entire layout and like description of things is almost entirely based on the Camarillo, California Public Library. All right, what do we got here? Another eye. Uh, do you keep track of fan feedback? If so, does fan opinions, ideas influence your writing? I don't know. Like keeping track makes it sound like we have like a spreadsheet of. <laughs> Of all the comments we get, I um, which we don't, which we don't. <laughs> you. Um, the uh, no, I mean, I we we get feedback by email and 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 Facebook and Twitter and and uh, I, on my Tumblr page too, and and you know it's uh, yeah we we take it we take it in when we get it. I, I you know I don't think it's I think it's more there there's a lot of it and the, a lot of it is really good so you you know uh, which is great and some of it there's some uh, critical or some thoughts or ideas. I mean, I think when we get into the realm of ideas, like here's an idea I have, I generally avoid all of that. Like, uh, If you put idea into the subject line or first sentence of your email, it, it'll be deleted. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and that's Sorry. not because we don't think it's good. It's just that as writers, we just have to, I just don't want to fill my head with other people's ideas about our show, right? They, they, you know, I want to make sure that we always want to think about it uh, as this is the thing that we are creating. I don't want to ever feel like, oh, I have all of these constant ideas coming at me from strangers on the internet, which means that strangers on the internet have a lot of good ideas. Um, and I think... <laughs> <laughs> they have a lot of ideas. I said good, and I should just have uh, scratched that. They have a lot of ideas. And... Um, <laughs> 
but yeah, I think I think it's mostly like yeah, we take it in and we process it in the way we process walking down the streets or taking in the, the environment around us. It, it's present, but it's I, um, not I, I have a secret Tumblr account, uh -huh. um, and one of my favorite things to do is fishing boat proceeds. Uh, <laughs> 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 I always knew it was you. It's me. Uh -huh. it's me. Um, one of my favorite things to do at about one o'clock in the morning after an episode has come out, I love to go on Tumblr. Mm -hmm and just kind of see what the fans have, their immediate gut reaction to an episode is. Do you write, do you, if your secret account, nope. do you like, hated this, hated it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag WTNV. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's uh, purely to observe. <laughs> okay. I just like, I like to know what's going on. Yeah. Especially because I, I remember being, you know, I, I mean, there's tons of things that, you know, throughout my life I was really, really into. And it, I don't know, it kind of gives me that jolt of, you know, nostalgia to be, wow, these people love this, thing that I help make so much. Um, and, and these are the people that wait till 12.01 to mm -hmm. download an episode. I don't know, I, I, I like it, I like it. And I like kind of seeing what their, what their initial reactions are. Mm -hmm. Y'all yeah. say hi to Cecil if That's you it. stay up late for the next episode. <laughs> All right, so this one is just a photo. Oh no, there is a, there is a thing, okay. But this is a photo, actually a really nice photo. That is nice. Or not a photo, uh, a yeah. drawing. Uh, which is a photo made by hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dictionary definition, yep. I will see myself out now. <laughs> uh, how far ahead do you plan episodes of the podcast? Um, d I mean, definitely we finish scripts. Like, so to the end of the episode, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's variable. You know, we, we try to keep kind of within the reality of the schedules we all have now because of the touring and the book and everything. We try to keep as ahead of the game as possible. Um, I think we're currently recorded through December 1st, which is a miracle. Mm -hmm. That's the farthest ahead we've been in a while. Mm -hmm. um, we also, you know, as, as we said before, like our writing process involves a lot of like casual conversation. So there's a lot of like one of us will say to the other, hey, so I have this idea that this thing we've been doing, I think it could end this way. And then the other person will be like, cool. And so then we'll know, oh yeah, in like six months that'll happen. Um, but it's not like that was on a spreadsheet. That was, that's just, and then maybe, you know, two weeks later, hey, so the thing you were talking about, I think we could make, I think probably we could get to it through by doing this. Um, and it kind of comes through. And then eventually uh, you hit a point when you're like, uh, you're writing the episodes to lead to that, where you have to sit down and be like, okay, here's all the ideas we made with, let's divvy them up and come up with the flow of it. But uh, to answer your question uh, as much as possible, but the word, life's hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we're in uh, final moment, so I'm just gonna pass you a few, just to do sort of lightning round okay. style. Okay, all right, lightning round. Uh, what Nightville death would you never wish upon your enemy? Oh my God, um, probably. I think one of the interns filed themselves. Yeah, <laughs> intern <laughs> Jody. Yeah. That was one of my favorite Jody. ones. Yeah, that was yes. one of my favorite ones. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, name, named after our agent. Because <laughs> I, I, I thought it would be a, a, a compliment that the She's intern so is organized. so organized uh -huh. is a and so good at her job that she uh, does her job to death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, did you originally intend for Carlos and Cecil's relationship to evolve into what it is today? I don't think it was our original intention. It was more just like as we created the characters, as we wrote the scripts and played along, and as you was as you performed the role, you know, you, we can hear. That's the great thing about serial uh, storytelling. The podcast. The, the serial and podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, here's my thought on Adnan. <laughs> <laughs> um, is no, in, in this type of storytelling, is we can write a thing and you. Yeah. record it and we hear it and we're like, oh, I see where Cecil is going with this. And while you didn't write the words, you're creating the character in a lot of ways. And so as that year went along, like, oh, this just, this is going this direction. This makes total sense to. Yeah, it was a very organic, I mean, we yeah. intended nothing really from the first episode. No. Like there was no plans. It was entirely episode to episode. And then it just was, just felt right, yeah. I guess. And I think uh, going back to that, that was kind of the, the training that we had at the Neo Futurist, mm -hmm. which is you get a script on Tuesday, you memorize it for two and a half days, and then you perform it on Friday. And it's this whole idea of just make a choice. Yeah. Go with your, go with your gut, mm -hmm. make a choice. You know, this is the script, D do the thing, and, and maybe you get a second chance to change it up. Yeah. Uh, but it's like you really kind of have to go, go with your gut. Yep. You know? 
All right, two more. All right. That's one. Uh, what is your favorite weather segment? Oh, that's an that's interesting a good one. question. I like that one. Um, so uh, generally, um, this is not a rule. There, there's sometimes that, that Jeffrey or CISO have said something that uh, have been like, put this on the weather. Um, but generally, the weather is just stuff I like. Um, and a lot of it is stuff that I've listened to for years, and some, uh, some of it, a lot of it more recently, is stuff that people have submitted. Uh, one of my absolute favorites uh, is, I kind of have two answers. One is uh, putting the people that we've worked with on the show has been really amazing. Putting the Mountain Goats, premiering a Mountain Goat song is, on the show was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Uh, putting Doom Tree and Dessa on the show was really incredible. Um, and, uh, but probably my favorite song um, <laughs> is that one. <laughs> That's my favorite song. Uh, is oh, uh, now I'm blanking on the name. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> oh, I bled on the bed from a wound in my uh, head. Is that on the night? Oh God! No, it's um, it um, it's that song. I'm gonna bet. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is uh, "This Too Shall Pass" by Danny oh, Schmidt. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No. Oh, uh, uh, I was I was really happy that you took my suggestion of Brenda McLean and stupid oh, yeah. to put. That was my yeah, Brenda yeah. McLean's my kind one. of I tossed that hat into the ring. Yeah. So thank you for that. I'm I'm gonna just that's shout out the song name whenever I remember it. So Great. just be prepared for Twitter. that. Twitter. <laughs> Cruel Temptress. Thank you so ah, much. Ah, nice. I nice. That was a really hard song to get because the band hadn't existed for years. They'd broken up years before, and so just finding anyone to give me permission to use it. But I, I really went after that one just because I really love that song. <laughs> All right, last one. All right, here we go. <coughs> Is there anything, place, event that exists in Night Vale you wish it exists in this world? I. Mm don't understand the question. Oh, it's like, is there Jeffrey, something, <laughs> something in Night Vale that you, that's not real in the real world that you wish were? Uh, I wish the, um, yeah, I wish that there was the, uh, um, I think the, uh, the bowling alley and arcade fun complex. <laughs> like, just as that exists, right? And I think that would be great. Because um, there's, a, there's a whole nation living under lane five. <laughs> it's pretty neat, so. I guess my question is, what do you mean, what, It'll, if it exists in the real world. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I like Night Vale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Visit it sometime. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I'm going to go with like Big Rico's. Yeah. I think would be yeah. kind of a cool spot to hang <laughs> out. You know. Get a cheese ball. Yeah. Right. <laughs> there you go. Um, on that climactic note, yeah. <laughs> always end on pizza as a rule right. in theater. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to thank Joseph. And Jeffrey and Cecil, thank you guys for Thanks, Lev. Thank, thank you so much, guys, for the question.